brothers and sisters god bless hope your night or day is going good everything's going well with you i wanted to address this comment that i got because i get this type of comment continually it's worded in a different way but it's always the same thing extracted down and it's basically a question so i'm going to answer the question so i'll read the comment first and we'll address the part of the comment that i'm talking about here hello i'm a bit confused by this video my understanding of the law is that there are two parts the first is the sacrificial part that part was fulfilled by jesus as he walked the earth for about 33 years resisted all temptation and was the retroactive and everlasting sacrifice for our sins the second part is the moral part it describes this what sin is according to god's absolution and what israel should not be doing fornication and idol worship etc my belief is that the sacrificial part has been satisfied but the moral part still defines sin and we need to turn away from sin are you saying that the law in its entirety is no longer active? Could I then say fornicate continuously, not repent, and still be a Christian who walks with Christ? So it's the last part of the comment that I want to focus on. My belief is that the sacrificial part has been satisfied, but the moral part still defines sin, and we still need to turn turn away from it. Are you saying that the law in its entirety is no longer active? Could I say, then fornicate, continuously not repent, and still be a Christian who walks with Christ? So extracted down, what he's asking me is, can I still sin every day and be a Christian? And the answer is yes, because you do sin every day, and everybody else on this planet sins every single day. So the question extracted down is, can I sin every day and still be a Christian? And the answer is yes. Now, he lays out these gross sins like fornication, idol worship. And in his mind, I know what he's thinking. He's thinking, well, under the law, I'm not doing these things. So, you know, if I was to do these things as a Christian under the law, would I still be a Christian? Would I still be walking with Christ? The problem with that mentality is under the law that he is guilty of these things. He's guilty of all of these things. If you consider James chapter 2, it says, Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of all of it. See, the problem with a lot of people, they have a mentality. They think, well, I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a murderer. You know, I thank God that I'm not a fornicator. Yet they don't realize that under the law, they have guilt, which then makes them guilty of the entirety of the law. Consider where it says, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that the whole world would become guilty before God and every mouth would be stopped. So under the law, everybody's guilty. Every mouth is stopped. No one has a righteous appeal in and of themselves. And so since they're guilty under the law and they're not keeping it, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of all of it. So under the law, you can't look around at a fornicator or an adulterer or a murderer and say, well, I'm better than them. I, I'm in a better position than them. Paul says, in Romans chapter 3 verse 9 are we any better than they certainly not for God has charged both Jew and Greek under sin so under the law nobody is in any better position than anyone else everyone else is just as guilty as you are and you're just as guilty as anyone else so when a person has the mentality well I'm not an adulterer I'm not a swindler I'm not an idolater I don't do these things so I'm better than other people no, you're not, according to the scripture. Are we any better than they? Certainly not, for God has charged both Jew and Greek under sin. So the human self-righteous deception is that, well, I'm not doing these things. I don't believe that I'm committing adultery or fornication. Therefore, I'm good with God because of my obedience to the law. And their mentality is, no way could I be doing these things and be okay or good with God and justified in his sight. And so they foolishly believe that their right standing is dependent upon their performance to the law and them not committing adultery, them not committing fornication or being a swindler. If you think about the parable that Jesus told about the two men that went up to the temple to pray, the scripture says that Jesus told this parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on others. He said two men went up to the temple to pray, one being a tax collector and the other a Pharisee. 
The Pharisee stood in the front of the temple and he said, I thank you, God, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not a swindler. I fast twice a week and I give one-tenth of my earning. The man in the back of the temple couldn't raise his eyes towards heaven, but smote upon his chest and said, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went home justified rather than the other. We see the man who recognizes that he's a sinner. He doesn't try to make any appeal to the law. This person could, could be an adulterer. He could be a fornicator. He could be a liar. He could be a swindler. Under the law, he's guilty of all of it. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of all. And he recognizes his guilt before God and he asks God for his mercy. He must have faith that God will simply have mercy on him independent from law performance. And Jesus said that man went home justified. Now the man in the front of the temple, he also believed in God. Both of these men believed in God because they came to the church to pray. But this man is appealing to his law performance. I thank you, God, I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a swindler. I fast twice a week and I give one-tenth of my earnings. But Jesus didn't say this man got favor or was justified. It was the ungodly person in the back of the temple just asking for mercy and having faith that God would give him mercy independent from law performance. So we see in the scripture, Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it says to the one who works, it's not counted as favor, but his wages due. That would be the man in the front of the temple. He's trying to work to get favor. He doesn't get the favor he supposes. He gets wages due. Next verse says to the one who doesn't work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. And that would be the man in the back of the temple. He wasn't working. He was just believing and having faith in him who would justify the ungodly. And Jesus said that man went home justified. So it's to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accredited to righteousness. And this is all in relationship to the law, that you don't have to work in accordance to the law. You don't have to stop sinning in order to be justified. See, the man in the back of the temple said, God have mercy upon me, a sinner. He actively knew that under the law, he was a sinner before God. The man in the front of the temple fails to recognize this because of his lack of understanding of the stringency of the law. He thinks he's not guilty of certain gross aspects of the law, like idolatry and fornication. He's not a swindler. He's not unjust like other men. So he's trying to make an appeal under the law as though he has some measure of goodness or righteousness under it. But again, the scripture says, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that the whole world would become guilty before God and every mouth would be stopped. And if you're guilty under the law, you're guilty of the entirety of it. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of all of it. So when it comes to the law, it's an all or nothing proposition. You either have to keep it all perfectly or completely without fail, or you have to die to it. And that's why the scripture in Romans chapter 7 says, Brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be joined to another, that is him who has been raised from the dead. So we have died to the law. We have died to something that would bring about a guilty ruling. We have died to something that would show us that we are unjust and would show us that we're unrighteous. Sometimes when I'm doing these videos, people get confused because they think that I'm teaching them to go off and sin. I don't have to teach anyone to go off and sin. You've been doing a fine job on your own. I don't have to teach anyone how to do that. But what is the motivating factor for the desires in our heart to change? Because some people feel that you can't have a gospel where you have died to the law, even though that's what the scripture teaches, because they're afraid that if you have died to the law, it's going to make you want to sin even more. It's almost as though some of these people can never see the grace of God as the motivating factor to try to have a change of heart and desires in accordance to sin. As I've tried my best to explain before, there's a conceptualization to the law that produces something, and there's a conceptualization to grace that produces something. The scripture says the grace of God has come to teach us to deny ungodliness and live sober and upright lives. So the grace of God produces a motivating factor and a change of desires in the heart that teaches us how to deny ungodliness. It teaches us something that the law can never teach us because the law conceptualization produces something as well, according to scripture. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. 
So what gives sin its power is law conceptualization. Believing that your right standing or your justification or your way of living comes to the law in some way that you have to look to this law in order to be made right, justified. You have to live by this law in God's sight in order to have a good relationship with him. But the Apostle Paul said, through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. So to live for God, you actually have to die to the law, not have a living relationship to it. And the reason why you have to die to the law to live for God is because in the life and death of Christ, it accomplished something on our behalf, and we live by faith in the Son of God. What he accomplished for us was a perfect righteousness and justification and sanctification and redemption completely independent from law performance on our behalf. And since he accomplished all of those things for us through his obedience, we no longer look to the law that would just show us that we're guilty. We have now died to it, but now we look to the Son of God by which we're made righteous in his sight. We have sanctification. We have redemption. And so the life that we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God. So through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. And to live for God is living by faith in the Son of God. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Knowing that when he loved us and gave himself up for us, that accomplished something. According to Colossians chapter 1, verse 22, he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So we're holy in God's sight without blemish and free from accusation, and this is completely independent from law performance. If you look to the law to believe that that's the reason why you're holy in God's sight without blemish and free from accusation, then you're not living for God anymore. You're not living by faith in the Son of God. If you're looking to the law for the reason why you'll be holy, blameless, and without accusation, then you're not living by faith in the Son of God anymore because the Son of God is the reason why we're holy in His sight without blemish and free from accusation. Through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. So to live for God, you have to die to the law. To die to the law is to die to your own self, to die to the idea that you can pr produce righteousness or justification or redemption or sanctification through your performance and through your obedience. You now die to yourself and you look to Christ and have faith in him that he's accomplished these things. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, if you're looking to the law for your holiness or your righteousness or your justification, then you're not living for God anymore. Because it's a denial of what Jesus Christ has accomplished. Through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. So extracted down, all this commenter is asking me is, can I sin every day and still be a Christian? Well, you better hope so, because if not, then nobody's a Christian. Nobody can be a Christian because everybody sins every day. He brings up kind of what appears to be bigger, grosser sins in a person's mind. And usually when I see people do this, and I'm not saying that's the case for this fellow, but usually when I see people do this, it's an emotional argument to downplay their own sin. That they don't see the severity of the sin in their own lives, they just see it in others. And it's just like the man in the front of the temple. I thank you, God, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not a swindler, I'm not unjust like other men. And they fail to see their own severity of their own sin under the law. And they also fail to see that according to the scripture, the stringency of the law and its perfection that it demands, that you can't just keep one aspect of it, you have to keep the entirety of it or you're guilty of the, of the entire law. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of all of it. So the law with its perfect standard demands perfect obedience, perfect compliance without fail, or you're under its curse. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse for cursed is everyone who doesn't continue to do all things in the book of the law to perform them that if you're going to be under the law you have to do all things perfectly completely without fail or you're under the curse and you're guilty of all and that's why according to scripture you have to die to the law through the body of the lord jesus christ brothers and sisters you have died to the law through the body of the lord jesus christ that you might be joined to another that is him who has been raised from the dead and only through dying to the law can you reduce the power of sin. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. So you have to die to the law to reduce the power of sin. 
these people like Ray Comfort, and that's who this guy's commenting on in that video I did about Ray Comfort. These people who promote law compliance and obedience like Ray Comfort after faith are only producing the power of sin in people's lives and at the same time presenting them with a false gospel that will only damn them on the day of judgment. So Jonathan, I'm not sure exactly what gospel you hold to. If you hold to Ray Comfort's gospel, you're going to be holding to a false gospel. But imagine for a second that the gospel that I teach is the true gospel. Just imagine in your mind, which you know I know it is, but just imagine in your mind, if you are not sure that it is, imagine that it is. Can grace not be the motivating factor for you not to be a fornicator or, or an idol worshiper? Can grace not be the motivating factor for you not to be a swindler or adulterer? Or does it have to be law hanging over your head that says, well, if you don't do this, you won't be saved, you won't be made righteous, and you won't be justified? If that's what you believe, you do believe a false gospel because you do believe then that your justification, your righteousness, and you being saved and have eternal life is dependent upon law performance. And it's not by grace anymore. And the scripture says, by grace, you have been saved through faith, not of yourself, but as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the scripture says we have been saved in the past tense by grace, and it's not of ourselves and not of our works. So it's not of anything that we do in accordance to the law that saves us, but it's grace that saves us through faith. And it's the knowledge of this grace, according to the scripture, that is the motivating factor to deny ungodliness and live sober and upright lives. If you take away the grace of God in people's life, like Ray Comfort, you remove the divine motivating factor that God has employed. His grace, which is the only restraining power of sin. And only through the knowledge of God's grace can the desires and motivational factors of the heart can be changed. But if you make it about law performance, it's no longer about grace anymore, and then grace can no longer operate in the human heart and mind. As the Apostle Paul said, if it's of grace, it's no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. If you make it about works, it's no longer about grace, and if it's no longer about grace, then you have removed the divine motivating factor that God has employed to deny ungodliness. If you're seeking righteousness through the law, then you nullify the grace of God. You nullify the grace of God, which is the divine motivating factor to deny ungodliness. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. So Paul said, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if my right standing, if my righteousness came through the law, which would reference his performance and his obedience, then Christ died needlessly. See, Ray Comfort gets people to nullify the grace of God in their mind. This grace of God is what will help them to deny ungodliness. The grace of God teaches us that we are righteous in God's sight, independent from the law. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Our righteousness and our right standing comes through the death of Christ, that he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And it's the knowledge of this grace that helps us with our deepest, darkest, sinful issues. But if you remove the grace of God from people's lives, it will never operate in the way that God intended it to operate. Which is one of the reasons why I think that Ray Comfort is employed by Satan. Because what he ultimately does is cause people not to bear fruit, not to deny ungodliness. He produces the power of sin in their life. And he also presents a false gospel that will only condemn them on the day of judgment. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. Hope your night or day is going good. Went on a little longer than I meant to, but hope you enjoyed the consideration. Take care. God bless. Then I got me down.